Hi, welcome to Ghostman Radio Station. And my guest tonight is John Hoffman. Who is John Hoffman? He's going to tell us a little bit about his transplant journey. He's a two-time liver transplant receptant. He was diagnosed with preliminary atresia. I probably said that wrong. As a baby. Preliminary atresia. Yeah. Okay. And was transplanted planted at Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh on January 4th, 1983. I was just 13 years old by the great Thomas Dozarski. Due to the experimental nature of my transplant, my small size came impossible in my teens that I would need a second transplant. I put in the list again when I was 15 and transplanted it on the July 1st, 1999, again, Children's Hospital Pittsburgh. And this is where... John would tell us a little bit about his transplant journey. How you doing? All right, so um, I um, I was born healthy, and um, I was diagnosed at six weeks with uh, biliary atresia, which is a breakdown of the bile ducts of the liver. Um, the first, the first kind of. Uh, Stopgap to that was called the Kasai procedure, which they used the bits of your, your intestine to try and, and recreate the bile ducts. And unfortunately for me, that was not did not work. It, it took about a week, and I was in about the same predicament as I was um, before the procedure. So at that time, they, it was determined I need to be I needed to be on the liver transplant list. Uh, at the time, all the hospitals managed their own list, all the transplant centers. So. Um, the, the, the transplant center of choice at that time was uh, Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh, and uh, the head of the transplant team was Dr. Thomas Starzl. He's uh, widely known as, as the father of transplantation. Um, I waited, I waited um, about a year, about a year until I was transplanted, uh, July f- or January fourteenth, nineteen eighty three. So I was thirteen months old at the time. Uh, it's very small. I was a, it's still a very experimental surgery. My parents had to sign some some waivers, and uh, I was transplanted. I spent about two two to three months in Pittsburgh, you know, uh, in recovery, battling things like pneumonia. While I was there, uh, I was home in April of that year, and grew up pretty normal. Besides uh, having to take medications twice a day and having a big scar across my chest, which as a kid, that was the most concerning thing for me, not wanting to take off my shirt and, you know, being very self-conscious about it. Um, as I grew, uh, my, my liver enzymes, as they're called, the numbers that they, that they use to determine the health of the liver started to escalate. And when I was 15, it was determined I would need a second transplant. So I was put on the transplant list and transplanted July 1st, 1999, when I was 17. That was uh, the summer before my senior year of high school. And by now, things were much more regimented. They knew what to expect. They were very, they were very um, consistent with their recovery process. So I was, I was out of Pittsburgh in about two and a half weeks that time and began to recover, gained weight, felt stronger healthier than I had ever felt in my life. So while physically I was in tip-top shape, uh, emotionally I had a lot of trouble, uh, I guess you could call it survival's guilt, survivor's guilt, dealing with the fact that, that two people had passed away and you know here I was still living. And at that point I was looking at colleges, I didn't have a major in mind, I was kind of, I kind of had a loss of direction. So that kind of uh, brought me down and, and gave me some trouble in college. Um, so at one point, um, my doctor determined that I should get some therapy and try to dig myself out of this hole. So I did that, and that certainly improved things a lot. Um, I got a good job. I got married. Uh, we had kids, and everything kind of smoothed out from there. Um, all along, I had been kind of figure, trying to figure out what to do with, with the gifts I've been given and how to properly honor the donors. So in uh, 2016, I decided um, the best way to do that was to, to put my journey on paper and to share it with, with everyone that may be waiting for a 
transplant or has recovered from a transplant and having similar questions as me. So the book writing process took about four years. In the middle of that process, I actually got a job at uh, a children's hospital in Connecticut near where I live. And it turned out that a lot of the doctors and nurses who took care of me are actually still there to this day and still working. So they recognized me and and it made great material for the book. Uh, a lot of them agreed to do interviews to give their side of their side of my medical journey. So it was really it was really serendipitous that, that happened during that time. I started a website. I started a blog to kind of share different anecdotes of my story. And my book was released uh, July first of 2021, which is uh, a little a little less than a year ago. So and now I've I've started to do interviews and, and share my story and, and promote the book and that's where I am today. Yeah, I, I as I said before we started, I think a lot of people don't realise there is always this fear of when you have a transplant that your body was going to reject it because it's quite common, isn't it? In the early stages of, I know they give you drugs and that right. to stop that, but it can happen i'm not saying it happens regularly but it can happen right yeah it, it can happen and, and like you said in the early stages until they came up with with kind of the wonder drug that kind of stabilizes all that which was called cyclosporin it was a very common occurrence and, and the uh, survival rate was i don't want to say it was 50 50 but it was it was not as high as it is today so with the immunosuppressive drugs it certainly it certainly made it a more common practice than it was now, you say saying only about survivor guilt. And I have heard stories, I don't know whether you've heard stories, of that sometimes when people have transplants from other people, like hearts and things like that, they suddenly develop a new skill they never had. I mean, I don't say this happened to you, but there are st- stories or myths on the internet. This happens, whether it's yeah. true or not, I don't know. Well, I, you know, a, a weird phenomenon happened to me not long after that. Being a teenager, I wasn't really a, a vegetable and a salad guy, but for some reason, after my trans, I started craving salads, and I had them a lot of the time. I don't know what you attributed to that, but it's certainly it's certainly a question. Hmm. And as you say, the survivor guilt thing is quite common. It's like if you're on an airplane and you're the only survivor out of how many people come off the plane. You know, it, it's a quite a common factor, and you said you had to have um, therapy for that. Did you find it very helpful in the end? Yes. Well, you know, uh, the big the big thing was, well, I don't feel I'm properly honoring my donors, and I'm properly honoring, you know, the doctors and everyone that contributed to, to keep me alive. And, and the therapy kind of taught me that just by living, you know, just by being a human being and, and being happy with yourself and, and being able to, to be productive and, and that was that was really one of the best ways to honor them is is by you know taking care of your body and taking care of the, the donated organ and, and that really helped a lot to see that did you know who the donors were uh, and were you able to contact the family or was that all hidden yeah, especially the first transplant, there wasn't really any any method for that. But even the second, uh, I was given the opportunity to, to write a letter that would be passed along, but unfortunately I, I didn't do that. So, no, I, I don't know who the donors are. I have kind of a vague knowledge of where they were from, things like that, but no, I, I, I don't know. If you could go back in time, would you now contact the family and say thank you or whatever? Absolutely, I would, and, and that's part of my sharing journey is trying to trying to come to terms with it, but also share and, and maybe you know pie in the sky dream would be to, to have them come forward and say, you know, this was my. It'd be nice to perhaps they might read your book or might hear it. Right, your no, absolutely various podcasts, and they might say, oh, I remember that story. Right now, your yeah, book sure. is called Liver, as in. L I V E R. <laughs> My yeah, journey it was kind of, of a play on words. Yeah, I like that one. Big, uh, big of that and living. I like the fact that in your on your website, after your summary, you have abstracts from your book. 
which is always nice to have abstracts because it gives you a feel of what to expect in the book. Exactly. Yeah, obviously, and, and lead up to it, you want to promote it and you want to get people interested. So that was that was a big deal for me to try to pick out some areas of the book that would that would intrigue and, and provide information. I think it's a good idea to promote the book that way. Have you ever considered doing a like an audio version of one of the excerpts for your book to promote it? Yeah, I absolutely have. I want to at some point, you know, put together the audio book, and and there are there are plenty of services that let you record it yourself or hire somebody to record it for you. But but that is an interesting idea is to record just an excerpt of it. That's well, well, I think you could you could do like, like a do. little if you want to add a little bit pictures to the video. This is only an idea. And then sure. you could go excerpt from chapter one of Growing Concern at my six week well child check up. However, it became apparent I was losing ground in hefty baby department that can carry on like that. You know? Yeah. And then they'll Certainly give people, straight away people go, Oh, I like this and then you could have a straight link to the book, whichever ser whichever is Amazon or uh, various other book sites, obviously, or straight to your um, website, and they can order the book, and it will give them the, that that way. I think you, you, I'm not saying you'll get more people buying sure. the book because I can't promise that, but I think right. it, I think it'd be worth your while doing that, uh, John. I agree. That's a good idea. And I, I like when I read the excerpts, you go into quite good detail and you keep it in terms that non-medical people can understand. Absolutely. Because you could yeah, have gone that, down that's the, a tribute. Yeah, that's the very a tribute medical to a beat. lot of the yeah. providers that, that, that gave interviews. You know, that was really a big deal to get that kind of detail. Yeah, because it, it comes across then because... You're thinking to yourself, oh, what is this diagnosis? And you're thinking, oh, God, I didn't realise in 1981 it affected one in 20,000 babies in the United States. That's quite a lot. Yeah, yeah correct. I like the reference to Doogie Hauser. <laughs> I like that. I used to like that show. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, as is mentioned in the book, timing of all of these events was very was very uh, helpful for me because my, my liver doctor had just started you know he had just begun his his career as a doctor and then he was able to so you could relate to this you could relate to the program quite well right yeah now you mentioned your blog now obviously um, what do you put in your blog? My blog is things that you, I mean, roundabout, you'd find them in the book, but but more, I guess, more lighthearted and more, you know, uh, my perspective on things that, that maybe that maybe are different from, from how the book is, is presented. So there, there are little anecdotes. I had my sister do a blog post. I, I got friendly with a, another transplant survivor. She did a blog post. So it's really about you know, just spreading awareness and, and telling different sides of the same story. Because it doesn't really matter if you're in the States or here in the UK or Europe. Basically, the process is virtually the same process as such. There may be slight differences, but not enough to... You could probably have the same operation in each part of the world. Yeah, you could. And that's who I... That's one of the people that, that did a blog post. She lives in, in Great Britain in the United Kingdom. She was a, we were able to relate. I mean, she had a heart transplant. I had a liver transplant, but we were able to relate on a lot of levels. Well, you've both been through that, that, that experience that only you can know the full um, way that you went for it. I mean, I've had a, I had a, well, I had to go into co uh, induced coma years ago for blood sugar levels. And, um, and that was a weird experience because technically you're not around for three weeks and you come, when you come out of your coma, it's like, what's happened to the world sort of thing? Right. Yeah. And not many people come through a coma. And I, 
Well, I, I, I believe I had a near-death experience when I had a coma, but that's just my personal belief. But I heard a lot of people have the same thing. Did you ever think, I know this is a bit morbid, and I don't mean to be morbid <laughs> in that respect, because I know you've got kids and that, but did you ever think at the time that it could be, oh, this could be the end, and I may have to live my life to the full? Yeah, there were several times. Um, as a teenager, you're already, you know, you have a lot of different thoughts going through your head. So waiting for that second transplant, absolutely. My friends can tell you there are a couple times where I really, I really questioned whether I'd, I'd make it. Um, the night we got the call, I was kind of, it was, it was all hitting me at once. I realized this may be the last time I've been in my house. This may be the last time I'm seeing these people around me. And yeah. I absolutely did question that at times. And I think that's part of the reason I didn't really have a direction because there was this looming almost deadline that I, I didn't think subconsciously that I would get past. I imagine that's a big part of the book as well. Your, that, that, that situation of dealing with um, things like that. But at least we we know through your journey and other people's journeys that that transplants work, and it's a fantastic part of modern medicine. Who would have thought a book we once were what uh, read called Frankenstein will one day sort of come true? Absolutely, and that was a big stigma attached to Doctor Starzl as he was he was going through this process they call him Dr. Frankenstein yeah because at the time it's misconception isn't it they read the book and of course they associate the book with the oh my god this is what's going to happen but they don't realise by research the the book the film is based on a horror story whereas the procedure of transplant is, is a long and establish scientific journey. Mm-hmm. Obviously, they had to use various other animals to get to this journey, sure. and some may find that controversial, but sometimes we have to do these things because we didn't have the gene slicing technology we have now. Right. Yeah, a lot of things, and they've actually gone back to animals. They've been able to transplant different organs from animals into people. Yes, I've heard so of pigs' way. hearts and livers. Mm-hmm. And yeah. It's strange, but I suppose because it's to do with the DNA, it must be a DNA link somewhere along the line that they can think is conceivable because they wouldn't normally go down that route without thinking it wouldn't work. Right. Oh, absolutely. It's, like you said, it's a lot of research. Do you, a lot of do, do you support your countries transport plant um services like you do you promote them in any way do you volunteer in any way i have not i have not i i am having three kids i've I've been very busy but it's certainly something i'd like to get into i'd like to be able to to help in promoting on on a broader scale and hopefully this the book is kind of a launch pad to doing those kind of things well you could do it through this way through when you when you do your podcast interviews, you could sort of add, like, the American where to go to get access to help and ask exactly. questions and general knowledge about transplants so people got a place they can go. I can add the English link when I do the put it on my podcast and the, and the video YouTube so that they, people got the English link because, obviously... I could give the American link as well as the English link. I'll find sure. it somewhere. There must be one somewhere. So. <laughs> well, yeah, there's there's an international registry also where it has all kinds yeah. of and it, It's important that we, people realise that when they ask to sign these documents, that it, you should be, consider that you were helping others. I mean, it's a hard decision to make at the time. It probably is a hard decision. 
but in you, it's a bit like um, giving yourself good karma further on if you believe in reincarnation or the soul being at peace in heaven and all that. It's your like well, yeah. bit of giving back. I don't know if you think I'm talking rubbish or no, no. I mean, you're doing a service to humanity, definitely. Do you did you turn to religion or are you religious because of this? can't say I'm terribly religious. Um, there would be, I, my aunt had kind of a, a, a serendipitous moment where, I mean, you could, you could say there was a higher power at play. Um, it's, it's in the book, but the short version is she was, she was approached by someone who she didn't know. And, um, they gave her a handkerchief and they said, you know, put this on the child's head and say, Jesus loves you. So she did, and, and the next day I got my call when I was a baby. So take it, you know, take it however you well, want. Exactly, but... it's it, uh, entirely up to interpretation. Of, exactly. Like everything right. is interpreted, isn't it? You can, yeah. but as long as you believe it and your family believe it, I have no problem with that. <laughs> exactly, and that wouldn't happen today because there's so much security in hospitals. You you couldn't you couldn't just walk in and do that. No, I'm pretty sure you're glad in one way it didn't happen during the COVID times. Exactly. Especially I mean, I know COVID is still about as such, but because of the, I generally believe now we had the first horrible, nasty wave. We had the not-so-bad, nasty wave. And I think, hopefully, we've had the third wave and it's all gone. Mm. Because if you look That's in cool. history pandemics tend to do this kind of thing. I'm not talking about scientific right. knowledge. I'm talking about historical um, mm -hmm. facts. And I may be, someone's going to probably put a comment saying, how can you say that? <laughs> I say, look at the Black Death. <laughs> it exactly. wiped nearly the whole world out in one swipe, virtually. You know, infected everywhere. Yeah. And then the second wave is like, not so bad. It killed people, obviously. And the third wave is like, oh, is that it? <laughs> yeah. Right. The old herd yeah, immunity, I which I know people don't like to hear that word, but it's true. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, having everybody get, get their boosters and, and, you know, just like people get their flu shots or, or some people get their flu shots, you're, you're not only protecting yourself, but you're protecting others. Have you got to be aware of your um, health because of the um, transplant in any way? Have yeah. I got to be aware of my health? Well, I, of course. I mean, I, I obviously pay more attention to to what I'm putting in my body. There's certain things because of the transplant that I just can't do. I can't play contact sports. <laughs> it's kind of a, it's kind of very extra dangerous for somebody like me. There are certain medicines I can't take. So I have to be very cautious about that. And COVID obviously ratcheted that up even more. And what does your wife and family think of your journey? Well, my kids, you know, they think of me as dad. They don't know a lot about it other than, you know, I have a big scar. And when I was little, I had an operation. I mean, that's another reason to write the book is to kind of let them see what I was like before I was dad. Uh, my wife is actually a a nurse and, a, and an APRN, so she can see it from both angles, from, you know, the the boyfriend and husband that I was, and also as a medical person, you know, what the, what the underlying cause and, and, and repercussions are. Well, I think so there's they, a point. I think you've got a very good outlook on life, considering what's happened. I would yeah, uh, I very yes. like to recommend your book. What is the name of your book? What's the name of your book again? It's Liver, My Journey of Transplant Survival. And where can we find it? The easiest way is to go to my, my website, johnstransplantjourney.com, and there's actually a book section, and there's a universal link, which will take you to a, a page that shows you all the different places you can get it. And I have a, I have a hardcover on Amazon, a paperback, and then I also have an e-book that you can read on your, on your reading devices. Thank you, and I'm, I'm pretty sure people are going to look at it. 
look for it. And I would like to ask your permission, if possible, if I could read the first extract from your book on my podcast, if that's okay for Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Sure. Thank you very much. I always like to ask the author, author's permission first, because I write books. It's always nice to ask the author. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, most authors don't mind because A, promotes your book. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I'd like to thank you for your, um, your, your little journey because I think it's fascinating. I've, I've learned little bits I didn't know, like mm-hmm. we all do. And Believe it or not, I learned things I didn't know. <laughs> well, yeah, I could believe that. And I think <laughs> I would recommend highly that people check out your website. Because it's got lovely pictures of you and your family and your sister and the doctors and such and such. And they can they can read a little bit about you and obviously you read the extracts and obviously hopefully go and write, write um buy the book. Is there anything you'd like to say before we go? Uh, I appreciate very much being on it and, and to be able, on your podcast and being able to share my story and hopefully it will inspire others and educate others and I, I you've inspired me my friend to be, be a better person I think we, sometimes we're all, we're all guilty of sometimes being self doubtful of ourselves I think we're all guilty of that I agree but thank you again for being on the podcast I will try and find out the uh, links for the I might do the international link because that probably be bad bad better for um, transplants and or liver transplants or tra- general transplants Correct. so people can find out more information for it and good luck in the future for any other podcast but please try out that idea about reading your book I look forward to listening to it okay I will do that thank you very much and uh, say hi to your kids and your wife for me they probably don't know who I am. <laughs> That's okay. But you can say, I've just been talking to some guy in Holsby in England. They'll say, where's That's that? Right. And you'll say, yeah, be well, Mark there. said, if you think of England as an old man carrying a pig to market, we're on the pig's trotter's side. Oh, okay. But that's all I learned in geography. Let it useful. Absolutely. Thank you, my friend, John. I do really appreciate your time and effort. And I thank you very much for being on my show. Absolutely. Goodbye, my friend.